Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and earn money, all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since we discovered Spotify for Podcasters, we have had so much fun trying out all of the features like Q&As and polls that let us be really creative and engage with our audience. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. Today on episode 46 of Podcast Royal, Her Majesty Mrs. Remembrance Sunday, Megan Wows in Scarlet Red, and Charles' right-hand man is out. We'll unpack all of this and more right now. Welcome back to episode 46 of Podcast Royal. It's another Tuesday, another recording session with my dear friend, Jessica. How are you? Doing well. How are you? I'm good. I can't wait to tell you what I'm into this week. I actually got out of the house and had some excitement. Well, why don't you go first? Ooh, shaking it up. Okay. Well, I snuck up to Nashville for two days. I think by now listeners know that we're based in Birmingham, Alabama. So Nashville is a little under three hours north of us. And I saw Katie Couric on her book tour. So Katie Couric is the reason why I went into journalism. She was on the Today Show our whole childhood. And then when we were in college, she became the first female anchor of a nightly newscast. And before COVID, book tours had replaced concerts as my favorite live events. I don't know what that says about me <laughs> at this stage in my life, but it's true. And this was my first event in a crowd since COVID happened. It was at the Ryman Auditorium in Nashville, which is an experience all on its own. And Katie was fantastic and was joined by Brad Paisley, who performed, and his wife, Kimberly Williams Paisley. It was just a great night out in Nashville. We stayed at the best Airbnb ever in Nashville, and it was nice to feel social and a bit more human again. That sounds like so much fun. I saw uh, some photos that you posted from the event and it just looked like a really cool experience. I'm glad you got to do that. Yeah, me too. And word, okay, pro tip if you are going to the Ryman. So I got to, I normally cannot afford to sit near any stage anywhere, but I could this time because the seat that I was sitting in was it now, now everybody's going to always do this. So I'm giving away my trade secrets, but um, I sat and wrote M C one. So that has an quote unquote obstructed view. Now there is a pole there, but I didn't have an obstructed view. I could see totally clearly. And because of that, I paid like a fraction of the ticket price to sit on the main floor. So there's my pro tip. If you ever find yourself at a show at the Ryman. <laughs> That is awesome. Yeah, uh, really, really glad you got to go experience that. Um, I, I still have it on my to-do list to make it to Nashville. You know, I've never been. Are you kidding? I am not kidding. I, I It is, like you said, under three hours away. And I have still never made the trip. Now, I'm not, I'm not local to Birmingham, so I've not been here my whole life or anything. Um, so Nashville used to be a, a farther trip for me anyway. Yeah. Um, but in the time that I've been to Birmingham, I have not managed to make it up to Nashville yet. And, you know, I love country music. So yeah, you um... do. there is no reason. <laughs> okay. Any, any pick a weekend, any weekend we will, I mean, we could do a day trip up there. It's really not that far. Yeah. I think, yeah, let, let's actually, let's do like a weekend trip or something. Yeah. And, okay. Nashville yeah, is it's so that. quick. And we stopped off on the, we came back today we stopped off in Huntsville at Rose's Mexican Cantina, which is one of my favorite 
um, restaurants. And so that divided the drive like into two hour and a half segments. So it was super easy. Okay. Well, that's on our 2022 list then. We'll do it. We can easily make that happen. So what I'm into this week is, and we were just, before we started recording, uh, laughing about all of the funny Christmas songs that come on the radio this time of year. Um, But I'm into taking inspiration from one of our episodes last year where we talked about um, decorating for the holidays, like the Royals. So I've seen, um, I've seen some ideas on Pinterest too, but I'm really into taking natural elements into the house. So, you know, real greenery. And, um, I saw a little tutorial online this weekend about how to dry orange slices. So you, you know, slice little round circles and dry them in the oven and string them up and make garland. And it was so pretty. And that's such a great way to one decorate really, really pretty, you know, in an affordable way, but also you don't have to store all of that at the end of the holiday season. You can kind of get rid of the the greenery or the old, you know, dried fruit. Um, and so I'm really into that this year. I've been seeing a lot of inspiration online and, and listeners, if you didn't listen to our episode last year on, on that, go back and check out some of the Christmas inspiration that we shared, but that's what I'm into this week. That's cool. That's awesome. I have not started decorating yet and I don't have a tree up yet, but Uh it's going to come right after Thanksgiving. So, yeah, I was going to say, I usually, I usually kickstart, I go into high gear on the holidays right after Thanksgiving because I like Thanksgiving and I want to give Thanksgiving it's, it's proper due, you know? And so I like to give Thanksgiving its moment, which Thanksgiving is next week. That's crazy. And, um, then it's full on Christmas season until basically the end of the year. So That's exciting. Well, we have, again, a packed Royal Rundown. Um, I, I, I don't want the news to slow down because hashtag job security, right? But um, I keep wondering when it's going to slow down, but it's not this week. So, okay, I am making the executive decision. We cannot kick today's show off with anything but the Salute for Freedom Gala in New York City last week, Megan. And that red Carolina Herrera was, in my eyes, everything. Um, So Harry and Megan, who we knew were already in the Big Apple, honored veterans at the gala, which was the night before Veterans Day in the U.S. and a couple of days before Remembrance Day in the U.K. So Harry gave a speech at the event where he said, in part, my experience in the military made me who I am today, and I will always be grateful for the people I got to serve with wherever in the world we were. Um, Then he said, but in war, you also see and experience things you hope no one else has to. These stay with us, sometimes like a slideshow of images. So for those who may not remember, Harry served a decade in the British Army and two tours in Afghanistan. So Harry, for his part, was in a black suit. He wore four medals in the cross for Knight Commander of Royal Victorian Order around his neck. Both Harry and Meghan sported the red poppy, which, as we discussed Last week is the symbol used since 1921, so 100 years ago, to commemorate military members who have died in war. So a couple of other highlights from that night. A reporter asked Megan if she was proud of Harry. Her sweet response was, I'm always proud of him. The gala recognizes extraordinary leadership and honors the men and women who serve, as well as raises money for the Intrepid Museum's programming. So what did you think of the event? Well, Harry's military service is a really important part of his life and career, and we've known that for a long time, and and I think it's great that he's so passionate about it and still finds ways to stay connected to that part of his life and honor service members who, you know, have had these sort of similar experiences. Um, I thought the couple looked great. Um, I thought both of them looked really great. Um, Bright red really kind of seems to be Megan's favorite color lately. Um, Mm. We saw her wear that last time she was in New York. Um, so I, I think for me, what stood out, I thought her hair pulled back in the bun was really beautiful. I loved her earrings, um, loved the dress, especially from the back. I really liked That's what I was going to say the back. The strap, yeah. The straps in the back and the long train, um, was really, uh, 
really beautiful. And it looked like her shoes were a rewear from her last time in New York too. They were that kind yep. of like red yep. velvet. Yep. Um, but it was, it was really pretty. They looked great. It was very Hollywood. I forgot the red look in New York last time. I much prefer this look just for the record. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> um, yeah. The dress from the back was my, was my favorite part. It was very Hollywood glamour and it was, it was beautiful. So not all of us may be able to afford Carolina Herrera. I know I certainly cannot, but we can all take an attempt at her beauty regimen for the night. According to her beloved makeup artist, Daniel Martin, I believe he told Allure this first. Here's what he used to create the look. The S he used a lot of Tatcha products. The Essence Skincare Boosting Treatment by Tatcha, the Water Cream by Tatcha, Luminous Dewy Skin Mist by Tatcha, <laughs> the mm -hmm. Kisu K-I-S-S-U Lip Mask by Tatcha. Moving on from Tatcha, uh, the Venus Crystal Cream Shadow by Cosette Beauty. I believe that was the purple, a little, uh, little eye line that, that stood out. Mm -hmm. um, matte Lipstick in Rosebud by Olivia Palermo. Brow Powder by Lamique. I hope I'm saying that correctly. A-L-A-M-I-K Beauty. And the Light Work Palette Volume 3, oh, I'm sorry, this is for the Purple Liner, by Danessa Myricks. So, I mean, she looks stunning, absolutely stunning. And, uh, and I, I love the dress, but I also loved her, her makeup as well. So, um, Daniel Martin has done her makeup for a long time. She did, uh, he did her wedding makeup and just kills it every time. So, the next day, which was Veterans Day in the U.S., Harry and Meghan hosted a luncheon for service members and their spouses at the joint base McGuire Dix Lakehurst, where they spoke with attendees about topics ranging from mental health to the importance of community. They also did um, an event with Afghan refugees. So I would love to know your thoughts on Harry and Meghan's kind of own Remembrance Week celebrations, which I obviously fully support, um, though unlike last year, we didn't see them on actual Remembrance Sunday. If you'll remember last year, I, I believe they laid a wreath at a cemetery in LA, mm -hmm. um, but we didn't see them on Sunday, but we certainly saw quite a bit of them during the week, and, and I loved it. So what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it was great that they chose to, you know, find ways to honor the military. Um, like I said before, you know, this is a passion of, of Harry's. Um, Megan looked great for this event as well. Uh, she had this like simple black wrap style dress. I think it was Giorgio Armani, black heels, and she had her hair long. It was, she was doing the middle part. It was kind of wavy. Um, she looked good. And, um, I, I like that, you know, I'm always supportive of these types of events. Um, I think they're, they're really cool and thoughtful. Absolutely. What did you think? Yeah, I thought that, I mean, the military is something that's so extraordinarily important to Harry. It's a, it was a huge part of his life and his work with veterans continues and it makes sense. I like how they did it because they very much obviously showed that they were honoring veterans day. Uh, but, but now that they're in the U S they really made it more about the 11th mm -hmm. and not that, them laying the wreath last year was them stepping on toes, but they let, they let the family, the Royal family have that weekend, which they, they always do. And so it was a nice balance because I feel like Harry got to really honor veterans in a meaningful way. And so did his family back in the UK. And so I, I real, of course I enjoy any Megan sighting I can get. I live for Megan's fashion. And so seeing her three times in three days was, I mean, a plethora of riches for me, but um, yeah, I mean, anytime I can see them is great, especially when they're honoring veterans. That's, that's a cause that's important to both of us too. So yeah, it was great. I, I enjoyed it. I want more. I want more of them. I need, I need three, <laughs> three days of the week with Harry and Megan every week. Well, that was not, you know, the only news about them we had this week. So we had some new developments in Megan's court case against the mail on Sunday. Um, listeners might remember. So she sued the mail on Sunday in 2019 for publishing that letter that she wrote to her father. And she had said that she intended for the contents of the letter to be private and not shared with the public. Um, so she actually won her case in February, but the mail on Sunday appealed 
And then following that appeal, Jason Nauf, who I think I'm saying his name right, who is her former communications secretary, revealed some messages that were exchanged between him, Megan, and Harry around the time all of this was happening back in like December 2018. Mm-hmm. So you might remember, and, and the story gets, there's like so many details. I'm going to try to like say this in a way that kind of all flows together for listeners, but you might remember when the book Finding Freedom came out, her attorney stated that she didn't cooperate with the authors to provide them information. Um, and you may remember, you know, the book is really, um, it, it paints Harry and Megan in, in a good light. So I think that's, you know, another part of this as well. Um, the messages that she and Harry exchanged with Jason kind of show a different side of the story, though. Um, they did give written permission to Jason to share information with the authors of Finding Freedom. So the emails show that he advised them against collaborating with Omid Scobie and Carolyn Duran, the authors of the book. And he said, you know, being able to say hand on heart that we did not facilitate access will be important. Harry chimed in and said, I totally agree that we have to be able to say that we didn't have anything to do with it. And then he also said, equally, you giving the right context and background to them would help get some truths out there. So Jason ended up sending Megan a list of topics to cover with the authors that included her relationship with her father and siblings, details about the um, wedding Tierra debacle. Listeners Mm -hmm. might remember that. Um, And then in in her messages, she talks about her letter to her father, Thomas Markle. So we're kind of coming full circle here back to this letter. Um, She references the letter saying, um, well, well, you know, in the letter, she calls him daddy. It's like five pages long. Um, And she says, obviously, I've drafted the letter with the understanding that it could be leaked. So I've been meticulous with my word choice, but please do let me know if anything stands out to you as a liability. And she also says, given I've only ever called him daddy, it may make sense to open as such, despite him being less than paternal. And in the unfortunate event that it leaked, it would pull at the heartstrings. So Megan has now apologized to the British court saying, I did not have the benefit of seeing those emails. And I apologize to the court for the fact that I had not remembered these exchanges at the time. I had absolutely no wish or intention to mislead the mail on Sunday or the court. In fact, I had been aware, had I been aware of these exchanges at the time of serving the reamended reply, I would have been more than happy to refer to them as I feel they strongly support my case. So Long story short, um, you know, she said that they didn't collaborate with the authors of Finding Freedom, um, but she had referenced this letter, which kind of goes back to that court case um, and her suing because it was supposed to be a private letter. Um, so, you know, I don't know. What do you think about this, Rachel? Do you have any any thoughts about how this looks or how it's going to play out? Yeah, I haven't done my due diligence on this. I'll be honest with you. So I, I'm reticent to really speak to it but um as Megan herself said at the deal book summit last week she already has won this case so I'm I'm not entirely sure and maybe you can clear this up for me what the Daily Mail is appealing well I you know that that's a good question too because I think there's so much to this I probably need to dig in a little bit more myself I just kind of come across this in the past yeah. few days um but you know it sounds to me like she's suing them because the letter was intended to be private and I think they're essentially coming back and saying you know got it yeah you know she knew that it would potentially be leaked and, and wrote it with that understanding. So I think their point Got is, it. did it really intend to be private? And she's, she's holding firm that, yeah, she didn't want it to be, you know, um, published. So I, I think that's kind of where they're going back and forth on this. Got it. Okay. That makes, that makes a lot more sense. Yeah. This is a story that I just, just to be perfectly frank, haven't had time to, to delve into with as much attention as, as it deserves, but um, it, of course, I mean, we always say this, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Um, I thought that this was over. Um, however, you know, the, the, I guess the daily mail, it's not over. So, um, we will see what happens. And I don't think that her texts or whatever they were with Jason 
make it seem like she hopes it will be leaked, but she's trying to cover her bases and say, okay, if it is leaked, that I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree. I think it's a little bit, I think it it does feel a little manipulative and you know when she references how to address him in the letter um I do think that this could be damaging to some degree to her reputation um because I feel like you you know would probably remember giving written um written authorization to collaborate with authors writing that book it was just a couple of years ago um, but, you know, at the same time, I think if we're looking at the details again, like, you know, I don't know that that necessarily changes the fact that she didn't want the letter to be leaked. You know, I mean, I, I get where she's, you know, to your point, um, understanding that it was a possibility doesn't necessarily mean that, um, she's what she wanted. To happen. So I think there's a lot of pieces there. Um, and we, sh- we can dig into this more and, and retouch on it next week. Um, I think yeah. you and I have both had super busy weeks and we kind of wanted to include it in here and talk about it a little bit, but, um, we can touch on it again when more comes out. Yeah. And I saw another story and I'm going to badly paraphrase this. So forgive me where, um, basically she, Megan was saying that, the royal family was really kind of all over Harry about Meghan's dad and, you know, was pestering him about what are you going to do about Thomas Markle? What are you going to, and so, you know, it's just all feel, you know what it feels like to me? It feels voyeuristic and I don't like the way that this feels like, I don't like being able to see messages that were intended to be private. Mm -hmm. Um, it just, it's the whole, the whole story just doesn't, it feels a little icky and, um, and, and so we'll see what happens with the appeal, but, um, it just, it just kind of all just feels like sometimes private communication should remain private, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, we'll see what happens in the court of law. We got, you know, look, one royal <laughs> court cases is far too many two is just oh my gosh let's let's get out of the courts shall we yeah for real <laughs> no but seriously it's going to be a long time before we can say that so anything else on that no we'll um we'll see what comes out from this and we'll touch on it again yeah i am positive that uh this is not over just like I'm positive the Andrew, I mean, obviously the Andrew court case is not over. So, okay, last week, this, I think this is interesting. Last week prior to the gala, Harry took part in Wired Magazine's rewired virtual summit in New York City, specifically its internet lie machine panel discussion, a topic which he unfortunately knows all too well. He said misinformation is a global humanitarian crisis. He also specifically touched on the term Megxit, which of course became a part of the lexicon after he and Megan's 2020 step back. He said the term Megxit was or is a misogynistic term that was created by a troll amplified by world correspondence, and it grew and grew and grew onto mainstream media, but it began with a troll. He continued, I know the story all too well. I lost I lost my mother to this self-manufactured rabidness, and obviously I'm determined not to lose the mother to my children to the same thing. The scale of misinformation now is terrifying. No one's safe from it. No one is protected from it. You can't hide from it. And we continue to see lives ruined, families destroyed in one single household. Okay, this is the most interesting part of that conversation to me. He also revealed in that conversation a bit of shocking information, saying that he warned Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey that his platform was allowing a coup to be staged one day before the January 6th invasion of the Capitol building here in the U.S., Harry said, Jack and I were emailing each other prior to January 6th, where I warned him that his platform was allowing a coup to be staged. That email was sent the day before that it happened, and I haven't heard from him since. So that's pretty, that's pretty crazy. (laughs) Um, That's, that's, that's wild. So what, what did you think when you heard this? 
<laughs> I mean, I thought that was really mm -hmm. odd too. Just, you know, that he had that thought and then just emailed him like, and it was all like the day before. I don't know. Something about that is, it's just kind of odd. Um, um, it feels like we're missing details or something. Yeah. I feel like there's a part of that story that is that we don't know, like the day before. And it's just, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, I, I think, I think we can all agree that misinformation is dangerous. Um, but I think that's such a big topic. I mean, the basic problem with setting things straight is that people disagree on what's truth, right? So there has to be some source of truth or everyone's kind of left to interpret their own truth as they see fit. And, and that's really how rumors start. That's how misinformation happens. Um, and, you know, I mean, this, of course, I feel like it's something that we've heard a lot about in the last year um, with social media, but it's certainly not new. I mean, people have been spinning truths for centuries and uh, you know this whole thing um when you were talking about megs and stuff it all kind of reminds me of like like being back in high school when rumors happen like remember the movie mean girls when they read the burn book and yeah. they're talking about like all of the lies or all the mean stuff that was written about people that that wasn't true you know but in real life it's really hard to track down kind of you know who started that rumor and where it all happened with social media and it's not confined to a high school it's across the whole world so it's all a very complicated issue but um but that was kind of my thoughts on that and, and misinformation and um you know it's it's definitely it's definitely swirling out there on the internet but um but there has to be a source of truth to be able to set records straight on a lot of that right Yes, I completely agree. And I'm sorry if you heard a crashing noise just a moment ago, I dropped something. So if you heard me go <laughs> Oop, in the background, <laughs> uh, my phone charger fell out of the wall with no with no apparent warning. So there's that. It's a Tuesday. So yeah, I mean, I, I just... I just think the timing of that is just incredible. And like Harry needs to go buy like multiple lottery tickets if he's able to predict things the day before. I mean, I'm sure that <laughs> that's just you know, uh, a strange coincidence, but my gosh, I mean, I agree that, you know, social media is and has been out of control. Misinformation is out of control. Um, cancel culture is out of control. Um, but I hope that through Archwell, Harry and Megan can find some solutions for that because it seems very, challenging to to tackle um and it like he said it's certainly not a new problem his his mother faced this as well you know um for me as a journalist it's all about journalistic integrity and being able to tell the truth and back up the truth and cite sources and um but i don't think everybody on the internet plays by those rules and that's scary that's true so my gosh, we've got like from climate change to misinformation on the internet to uh, <laughs> Andrew's court case. We we handle a plethora of tough issues every week on this show. So here's some happy news. Um, as uh, when I went to Katie Kirk last night, she said whenever we had to transition from a tough topic to uh, a, a lighter topic, we'd say on a lighter note. So I'll I'll employ that and say on a lighter note. <laughs> um, <laughs> Elton John was made a member of the Order of the Companions of Honor, which is a special award given to those who have made major contributions to the arts, science, medicine, or government over a long period of time. So in addition to the Queen, there can only be 65 members of this exclusive club at any given time that are alive. I should point out. Interestingly, it was Prince Charles who presented Elton with the honor. And of course, Elton was famously close to Charles's ex-wife, Diana. Of the experience, Elton said, an incredible honor to be made a member of the Order of Companions of Honor today, an acknowledgement of my services to music and the fight to end AIDS through the Elton John AIDS Foundation, which he tagged as at EJAF. Thank you to the Prince of Wales and Clarence House for your recognition and support. So is it awkward that Charles presented this honor to such a close friend of Diana's? You know, I don't think it is. I mean, 
I'm sure, you know, these two men have crossed paths so many times over the years. I really don't feel like it's weird or awkward for them, but I don't, what do you think? No, I don't think so. I think that, you know, Charles is, is the heir to the throne and right. <laughs> this is, this is an incredibly high honor. The queen is not working at the moment, or at least not working off of zoom and light desk work. And so it makes sense. Um, I'm sure that both men handled this incredibly professionally. They're both professionals. And um, I think the real story is that, you know, it's cool that Elton John is in this really exclusive club and um, you know, it, it makes, it makes sense. And William actually was busy that day anyway, he had some investors, investitures that day, um, him, himself. So, um, I think that it's only drama if we make it drama and I'm not going to make that drama. So, but both men, I mean, both men looked really happy to see each other. And of course, Elton John looked very happy to be receiving that, that huge honor. So, um, speaking of Charles now, Here's a little real drama. Michael Fawcett has resigned from his role as CEO of the Princess Foundation following an ongoing inquiry into exchanging cash for official honors, which we've covered on the show in the past. Um, I, I think somebody had to go. It was, I mean, Charles can't go, right? Mm-hmm. I think I think this was inevitable. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think in in situations like this, bad PR leads to resignations, whether a person is guilty of speculations or not. And I'm not really speaking on this particular um, situation. I'm just saying in general, when, when you have this sort of thing go on, it usually always leads to resignations. So I think it had to happen. Um, and I think especially the Royal family, they've got to weed out any kind of potential unethical behavior. And, and, you know, they just can't, they can't have an openly corrupt monarchy and expect it to survive in modern times. And I'm saying this as I'm also aware that there are other members of the royal family who have been caught up in scandalous situations lately. Um, and I'm not ignoring that. I think I think those things have to be handled and dealt with too if they're going to continue to to be effective. Um, but no, I mean, you know, I'm not surprised at all. Yeah, I mean. It's, it's a loss for Charles because Michael Fawcett has been around for a long time, long, long time right hand man of Charles, but um, I don't know if this means that there's actual proof in the pudding that there was an exchange of cash for honors, but um, obviously there's enough there to, um, for him to leave. And so hopefully, um, yeah, we just all too soon even if it's five years from now we'll have a new monarch and that monarch will be Charles and he needs he already comes with baggage there's no way to ignore that and he needs to be as drama free going into his reign as possible and so um, Michael Fawcett is out this is the kind of the the closing the loop on that story um I hate to see it because I hope it's not true, but Kate had a reunion last week with two people she photographed as part of a project to highlight survivors of the Holocaust. Kate's photos are featured, I think this is really cool, among 50 other photos in the Generations Portraits of Holocaust Survivors exhibition at the Imperial War Museum. And we saw a lot of the family this weekend. I loved it. On Saturday, the Cambridges, along with Charles and Camilla, Edward and Sophie, and other members of the royal family were at Royal Albert Hall for the Festival of Remembrance, a yearly musical tribute to remember fallen soldiers. The Queen, as we knew beforehand, was not in attendance at the Festival of Remembrance. But unfortunately, we were hoping to see her at Remembrance Sunday, but we did not see her at Remembrance Sunday the next day. Her Majesty sprained her back um, sometime around November 11th, which was last Thursday, and was unexpectedly unable to make the Remembrance Sunday ceremony at the Cenotaph on Sunday, obviously. Um, While we don't know how the Queen sustained this injury, it is apparently not related to the health issue that caused her doctors to advise her to rest for two weeks. They're two separate events. 
This will also likely be a difficult week for Her Majesty as what would have been her 74th wedding anniversary is on Saturday, November 20th. So what are your thoughts on Her Majesty missing only, I think, her seventh Remembrance Sunday? The other misses were for uh, either because she was pregnant or because she was out of the country. Um, only seven times she's missed Remembrance Sunday in her entire reign. We know this event is important to her. She expressed that in so many words, but as someone who's had back injuries before, it, it's very difficult to walk um, if, you, if, you, if you are injured. And so what are your thoughts on this? Were you disappointed? Oh yeah, I was super disappointed she missed it, you know, both for her and for all of us who wanted to see her there. I think we were all hopeful she would be able to make it and we were looking forward to her reappearance. Um, and, and this has just been a really difficult year for her. And we've said that before on the podcast and, and I'll say it again. I hope she recovers quickly again um, and, and can attend engagements as she feels ready. But um, but this was one event that she had specifically said she intended to be there. We knew it was important. And so um, I, I do hate that she had to miss it. And she also missed an appearance in the Church of England's National Assembly today, which is Tuesday, she sent son Edward in her place. This is the first time she's missed this event in its 51 year history, but we knew she was going to miss this, but we did not know that she was going to miss Remembrance Sunday. So I hope she's okay. And, you know, we've got uh, in a moment, I'm about to talk about some exciting things being planned um, in addition to what we've already reported on for the Platinum Jubilee. And so I hope that we see her a lot before then, but. Um, I just, I hope she takes care of herself more than anything. And I know that that's what you wish as well. Yeah. So some exciting news from the Royal Collections. This just increases my want to go to the UK for the Platinum Jubilee next summer more than ever. So to honor the upcoming Platinum Jubilee, visitors can take part in three separate exhibitions across the Royal Palaces next summer, including getting a firsthand look at some of Her Majesty's outfits from her accession, her coronation, and her jubilees. Like, I seriously want to make this happen. I mean, I've said this once, I've said this a million times, but the accession exhibit will take place at Buckingham Palace from July 22nd to October 22nd, when a series of portraits taken by Dorothy Wilding will be displayed. Dorothy Wilding became the first female royal photographer in 1937, and these shots are, I mean, I've only seen them, you know, just on the internet, but I'm sure in person they're even more striking, but these shots of the queen are, are beautiful. Um, the second exhibition will be at Windsor Castle from July 7th to September 26th, and will feature the queen's coronation dress and the robe of a state up close. I really want to go to that one. That is probably the one that I'd pick if I could only choose one of these three. And finally, the third show at Holyrood House in Edinburgh from July to September will feature a display of outfits worn by the queen at her jubilees of years past. So her silver, her golden, and her diamond jubilee outfits. And additionally at Holyrood House, there is a new exhibition, Masterpieces from Buckingham Palace. And at Buckingham Palace, visitors can take in the exhibit Japan, Courts and Culture, and take part in the Royal Muse again. Um, they, the Royal Muse, the horses, it's been shut down since 2020 because of COVID. So 2022 is going to be such an exciting year. No better time for us and everyone else to get over to the UK. So do any of these exhibits sound appealing to you? Oh my gosh, so many of them sound great. And um, you you called it exactly what I was thinking. The first one that really stuck out to me was the exhibition at uh, Windsor Castle with the coronation dress. Um, yeah. I would love to see that. Um, and I think it would be really fun to see the Royal Muse too. That would be a really cool one. Yeah, those are open. It's open again for the first time in nearly two years. And so, um, but the, the one at Windsor, I mean, I would love to go to all of them, but the one at Windsor would be, spectacular um how cool like and and by the way uh norman hartnell who designed her wedding dress also designed her coronation outfit as well so um camilla who we saw over the weekend at remembrance events took to writing to highlight domestic violence again writing that two women are killed this is a horrible statistic two women are killed every week by a current or former partner in England and Wales. 
she wrote in WI Life, which is sent to members of the Women's Institute. This tragic statistic has not altered in several decades. Thousands of lives have been lost, she wrote. So I am thankful to Camilla for continuing to raise awareness. We spoke about this a couple of weeks ago when she spoke um, about the same topic at an event. So this is exciting. Camilla and Charles are on a royal tour uh, to Jordan and Egypt right now. They're, they landed today, Tuesday, their first overseas visit since the pandemic. It's so great to see the royals back on tour again. The visit is set to focus on climate change as a main theme along, oh, imagine that, climate change, what? We never talk about climate change. Mm -hmm. I say this very respectfully. Um, along with interfaith dialogue, female empowerment and efforts to preserve cultural heritage, according to Charles's private secretary, Chris Fitzgerald. And so a fun Royal Jordan connection. The Duchess of Cambridge lived in Ammon, Georgia for a little over two years from May, 1984 to September, 1986, which is coincidentally the month I was born, where her father, Michael Middleton, worked at British Airways. Kate has always said Jordan held such a special place in her heart. And since she lived there from the time she was two until she was four and a half, she likely had some of her first memories in the Middle Eastern country. So how good is it to see royals back on tour? Yeah, it's really good. Really good news. Um, I was excited to hear that they were going to be doing that. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to all the photos that we'll get from the trip. Yeah, it's only day one today. So forgive us because this episode will come out on to or on excuse me on Wednesday so there will surely be more news but they have just kicked off their tour and they are in good form so we're going to move into segment two royals around the world we actually have three quick snippets for you so a quick note to report that the former princess Mako of Japan of course she's given up her title now that she is married has officially landed stateside. She arrived with new husband Kai Kuro at JFK Airport in New York City after a 12 hour flight from Tokyo this week. And though Princess Charlene is home in Monaco, which we're excited about, she is temporarily withdrawing from public activities. She canceled her scheduled appearance at National Day in Monaco this upcoming Friday as she is in a state of profound fatigue and still battling ongoing health issues. We continue to wish Charlene good health. And finally, apparently, it is tradition, tradition excuse me, for heirs to the Dutch throne to have books published about them for their 18th birthday. Imagine if that was the tradition for the British <laughs> royal family. That would be awesome. Um, and as the Netherlands Princess Katharina Amalia turns 18 on December 7th, she is following with tradition in publishing the authorized biography Amalia, written by Claudia de Breges. She reveals in the book she is in no rush to become the reigning monarch. I can imagine that. She's only 18 years old or 17 right now. And that she loves tiaras and has an innate ability to recognize all of the tiaras across Europe, which when one is in her position, I suppose, is a great skill to have. So um, I need to find a way to read that book. And um to look into that because you know that we're big readers here so um she seems so down to earth and cool and um she's 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 all, we've talked about her on the show before so um that's what i got anything any other news items before we turn it over to you i don't think so i think we had a super full royal rundown today on all friends so i will move into some more Christmas shopping inspiration. Um, so it. last week we did a little gift guide for the men in your life as inspired by mostly Prince William and a few of Prince Charles. And, and I think we put Prince Harry in there too, but um, this week we are going to do a little gift guide for people who love Queen Elizabeth. So you know, I know last week a lot of it was kind of high-end stuff. Um, but this week, I wanted to focus on something kind of more fun and affordable. Um, and, and I think a lot of these gifts are really something that would be great for anyone on your list who loves um, Her Majesty. So first up 
is the beautiful book by royal photographer Chris Jackson, Queen mm. Elizabeth, A Queen for Our Time. So this is a stunning collection of photographs taken of Her Majesty over the course of his career as a royal photographer. And listeners might remember we did interview him a few weeks back and we talked about this book. Um, so you can get it on Amazon for just under $38. And it really makes a gorgeous addition to any coffee table. I mean, it's big, it's substantial. I mean, if you have house guests over, they'll want to flip through it and admire the photos. And Rachel and I actually did that when we went to dinner a few weeks ago, we flipped through it and um, there's so much to look at. So yeah, it's uh, a beautiful book. It really, yeah, it really is. And, and I think, I think $38 is a great price point for what you get with that book. Oh, it's, trust me, it is a beautiful coffee table book and worth far, and we're not just saying this because he was on the show. No one's paying us to say this. It's a great book and worth way more than $38. Yeah, I was surprised at, at how affordable that was. So definitely a really, really nice book for, for someone on your Christmas list, list this year. Um, okay, so next is another really beautiful piece of art. Um, so I found this on Etsy and it is a digital print and it's two images of Her Majesty. So there's one when she was a young queen and then one in modern day, much later in her reign. And the two images of the queen are standing back to back. Um, the younger, you know, and, and the older, their their backs are facing each other and they're looking away. And then you've got the Union Jack flag waving above. And um, there's a little title at the top of the picture that says Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Um, so it's just a really, really pretty print. And it would be so special to give as a gift. You could, you know, frame it and wrap it up really nice. Um, the print is also it's on Etsy. It's from Amy Duarte Designs um, and it's $18. So pair it with a frame. And Rachel, I don't think you've seen this one yet. So I'm going to show you a picture of it later and you're going to love it. I'm sure I will. Um, but no, I have not seen it. So I can't wait to see it. All right. So next on the list is for our tea lovers. Um, another Etsy shop I found called Iconic Passion. Um, you can get a mug from this uh, from the shop with a black and white image of a young Queen Elizabeth's face and her sparkling tiara. And I thought this would be really great paired with like a box of English breakfast tea and a tin of biscuits from like Fortnum and Mason because we know they have um, royal warrants both from Queen Elizabeth and Prince Charles. So the royal family is a big fan of, of this brand and they have really nice high end products. Um, the mugs are on Etsy go for just under $14 um, and you can go fancy with the tea or if you don't want to order from Fortnum and Mason, you could do something like Twinings. I actually think they've had a royal warrant since like 1837 or something like they were one of the first teas to get a, war a warrant from the royal family and you can find Twinings just about anywhere. So I thought that would be a fun little, you could even make like a little basket out of it. Yeah, that's cute. All right. So number four is continuing on with Fortnum and Mason. This is a little bit, a little bit more of a high-end gift, I guess. Um, and it would make a really great hostess gift. If you have like a Christmas party that you're going to, you want to take something to the host. So on their website, they have a ton of options. I mean, you could just flip through the whole site and, and find something, but I came across some cheese accessories. So they have a beautiful blue and white. It's called Willow's cheese platter and it's a, a China um, cheese platter. And it actually has a little poem that goes along with it. So the poem says two balloons soaring on high, a car full of revelers roaring by a field with three cows chewing the fat, a milk bottle tree, a milkman and his hat. A platter of fromage with bread and wine, a glorious way to pass the time, an evening dew with light and laughter, a feast for the lunchtime and the sunshine after. Oh, so isn't that a sweet poem? Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, this platter retails for just over $50. Um, you could also go for a cheese knife set that they have on their site. It's got three cheese knives for hard and soft cheeses. They have really nice like stainless looking blades and they're engraved with the Fortnum and Mason name and they've got wooden handles. The set goes for just over 73. 
Um, so it's just something to kind of think about if you have um, a party you're going to and you want to take a nice hostess gift. Rachel, are you a big cheese connoisseur? <laughs> yes, I love cheese. Like I, my, that just reminds me of my grandmother. She was like cheese queen. Like she just loved it. I mean, I'm probably not as passionate as her, but I definitely love me some cheese. Yeah. So when I was little, I did not like cheese, but in my adult life, I have grown quite fond of it. And I love, I love trying different cheeses, but you know, you really can't be like, um, oh gosh, like at Christmas parties, I love a good like goat's cheese log. There's one at, um, one of the grocery stores in town and it's, it's goat's cheese and it's covered with like, um, cranberry dried cranberries. I think mm-hmm. it's so delicious. There, there really is nothing better at a Christmas party than the cheese log. I mean, that's that now though. Okay. I know this isn't real cheese. This is artificial cheese, but string cheese. I hate, I don't know if you know this about me. My mom loves string cheese. I think it is the, just the grossest thing, but yet I'll eat mozzarella sticks, which is basically string cheese with like fried crust on top. But anyway, um, I love cheese and like the, the cheese wheel or the cheese plate, um, you can dip your crackers in like that's, that's the best at any Christmas party. Well, I'm with you on the string cheese. I've never really been a big fan of that either, but I, as much as fancy cheeses are, are good and fun. I also just like, I don't know if our listeners, if you're not from the South and you may not have done this, but you know, um, just like the block of cream cheese with pepper jelly on top. Have you ever had that, Rachel? Is that laughing cow? Uh, I mean, no, you could just get like, um, like what is the brand? Just like the, just like the regular, you know, cream cheese in the grocery store, like the big yeah. block of like Philadelphia. A lot of people use Philadelphia. Uh, yeah. I, I like Philadelphia. Yeah. I think cheese, I mean, I think cheese makes everything better, but, um, but the one thing I cannot get behind is string cheese. And I would just like this, this is neither here nor there, but I would like the world to know that I think string cheese is disgusting. <laughs> no one cares about my feelings on that, but now, you know, I am a big fan, not to get too off topic here, but I am a big fan of like the, um, the imported cheeses from mm-hmm. different parts of Europe. Oh gosh. So I would good. do anything for like some brie right now. <laughs> Okay. I'm, I'm also hungry and tired and all of the things. So <laughs> I'm, yeah, yeah, that sounds amazing. So we'll wrap up this uh, list with one more item. And this is for our fashion lovers or maybe our artsy people. Um, if you have a friend that you want to get her something just kind of inspired by Queen Elizabeth, grab a bottle of Essie nail polish and ballet slippers. Yes. So a nice set of colored pencils or markers and pair them with the cutest Queen Elizabeth coloring book pages that I found on Etsy. Okay. These are cute, Rachel. Um, and it would be so much fun to do this in, in your free time. So if listeners, you know, if you're into adult coloring books or if you know anyone who is, um, there's an Etsy shop that has these digital downloads and you could go and do the download, get it printed at like an office supply store or a printing shop on really nice quality paper. So the shop is KF Illustration on Etsy. They sell the digital download. It's $5. And I think you get like four or five coloring pages per download. Um, but they're all, um, you can get them like there you can get one and it's all Queen Elizabeth with different dresses on, or you can do like a mixed set. And there's one of Queen Elizabeth, Princess Charlotte, Kate, Megan, and I think even Eugenie um, is in there too. Um, but the whole shop is good. There's other options like mugs and notebooks if coloring pages aren't your thing. But I really love the idea of wrapping up some coloring book pages with some fun markers and a little bottle of uh, nail polish. So that's really cute. Yeah. Um, so that, that's what wraps up our list. Um, just five quick little items at various price points for different people on your list. And I hope it at least jogged some, um, some creative thoughts for our listeners. I like it. I like it. I like it. Well, anything else for the good of the order? I don't think so. I think that wraps it up for us. Well, that is episode 46. So a little housekeeping note, listeners, we are taking next week off for the U.S. Thanksgiving holiday. 
So we'll be back on December 1st. How is it already December is what I want to know. With a new episode, we actually have three big interviews before the end of the year. So we're going to go out of 2021 with a bang. So happy Thanksgiving to our U.S. listeners. We are so thankful for all of you, our listeners. So we'll we'll skip next week and be back December 1st. So don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Podcast World. Didn't post a doggone thing this week. Maybe that'll change with the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, email us at hellopodcastroyal at gmail.com. Follow, rate, and review our show if you have Apple Podcasts. And we appreciate you listeners. We are thankful all the time for you, but especially in the season of thanks. We thank you for being on this journey with us. And thanks for being here for episode 46. Bye. Bye. Thank you.